Good morning, guys. Um, if we haven't met yet, I'm Pastor Jeremy. I'm one of the lead pastors here. And if you will, uh, turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 35. Exodus chapter 35. And while you're turning there, I want to put a word in your brain um, to consider as we go through this entire uh, sermon. Um, the words discipleship. The words discipleship. Uh, discipleship is... Um, a life learning from Jesus and a life spent living for Jesus. Uh, it's a lifelong journey, discipleship. It is, uh, it is what we're supposed to do as a church. My job, um, your job as believers are to make disciples of every nation. That's what we're to do is to disciple folks. And that's what um, today's about. Discipleship is about a journey that we go on. Uh, from the minute that we experience God speak to our hearts and then we're saved and then we're in this just life of sanctification, of trying to have right thinking and right living and just things that would please God. Man, it's, it's just, it's an up and down journey too. It's uh, you know, filled with tragedies and triumphs. It has you know, these, these ups and downs of just um, of times of desperation and deliverance. Um, just that's discipleship. And I think that we get a glimpse of just what the journey of discipleship is all about is when we look at the nation of Israel and their experience uh, with God and their discipleship from the Exodus, okay? So that's what we're gonna do. And look, what I wanna do is, to, before we get to verse 30 or, or chapter 35, I wanna kind of set this up, give you a little pretext of what's going on here. The nation of Israel... Okay, that were that were God's people. They were that's what they were called. They were God's people that were called out and chosen by Him. They, they found themselves in political slavery for about four hundred and thirty years, four hundred and thirty years of slavery to the Egyptians inside of Egypt, and they began to cry out to God to be delivered from that, for, for, for something to happen so that they could get out of this harsh slavery that they were in. And God called. One man named Moses, and Moses um, um, was sent by God to tell the um, leader of, Israel, I mean, of Egypt, the Pharaoh, to let God's people go so that they could go worship him, that they could go serve him. And um, Moses um, comes before the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh won't let the people go, and God kind of does this work there. And then there's ten plagues that come on the uh, nation of Egypt to try to kind of kind of force their hand to let God's people go. And the final plague is the Passover plague. And what happens is is that God sends death, the death angel, to come over the nation, over the land of Egypt, and it's going to kill every firstborn child, firstborn child unless when the death angel passes over that home, if there's blood of a lamb that has been um, um, sacrificed and placed on the doorpost of that home, then death will pass that house by. And death does pass by the homes of all of the nation of Israel. And then the next day, or actually later on that night, actually the leader, uh, the Pharaoh of Egypt says, look, let your, your people can go and they can leave. And what happens is, is they leave. But if you're familiar with the story, Moses, as he leads these people out, Pharaoh decides to pursue and then they're trapped and then the Red Sea parts, right? Moses holds up his staff and the water, I mean, the winds blow and the Red Sea parts and the people of Israel come out and they're on the other side and then God shuts the waters up, man, and they get to watch their oppressors. Those people just um, killed right before their eyes and they sing songs and they celebrate all that God has done for them. And then the next day they wake up and realize that their stomach's growling and they start complaining and they're like, oh, what, why did you lead us out here, Moses? Why did God deliver us from all this stuff just so that we could come out in the middle of the desert and starve to death and we need some food? So God provides for them by giving them Krispy Kreme donuts every morning in this thing called manna. It's it, it really, when you read it, it's called the sweet wafers. Sounds like Krispy Kreme to me. It's what I would want if I was out in the desert. And so God provides that for them. And then they're like, you know what? This is great. We love this Krispy Kreme every day and these, you know, the, but, but we don't have anything to wash it down with. So they start complaining about not having any water. Moses taps this big rock and water comes out of the rock. So God provides 
water for them. And then they find themselves at the base of this mountain, Mount Sinai. Um, I used to have an old preacher that called it Sinai. It is not Sinai. It's Mount Sinai. And um, they were at the, found themselves at the base of this mountain. And Moses goes up on the mountain to talk with God to see what's this going to look like as they walk through the wilderness together, right? And he goes up there and he gets the Ten Commandments, right? Well, he's up there for 40 days. Um, they're talking with God and getting these commandments. And in the middle of it, the people are down there and they're like, this Moses dude's dead. You know, he's been gone for 40 days. He's probably dead. So, you know, he, he got too close to this guy and the God's probably killed him. So here's what we're going to do. And they go to the other leaders and they say, hey, make for us some gods that will go before us. And they bring their bracelets and their earrings and all the gold that they have. And they melt it down and make a golden calf that they say that golden calf's going to, I, look, I mean, I like beef, you know. I mean, I like some milk too, but I don't think the golden calf's going to go before us and kill the Philistines or anything. But they do it anyway, and they make this golden calf. Well, I love in the story, God's talking to Moses, and it's been, look, God's been like, let my people go. I'm going to deliver my people. And then when he sees them doing this, he says, Moses, you need to go down there and get your people. <laughs> he says they're down there acting like a bunch of idiots, and you need to go take care of that, right? So Moses comes down the mountain. He discovers that they're all in, you know, doing this stupid stuff with this golden calf. He throws the tablets at them, like breaks the, you know, the, the tablets in front of them, and then opens up a can of some whoop, you know what, on a whole bunch of them, and then goes back up the mountain and says, look, I'm going to go back up, and I'm going to talk to God and see what he's going to do. So the people are left in this, okay, Moses is gone back up there. Well, Moses comes back down and he says, look, here's what God has said. God has told us or told me that he wants to live with us. He wants us to build him a tabernacle, a place for him to dwell. And he wants to live among us. He's given us not only a second chance, but he's like upgraded. It's not going to be this pillar of fire and this cloud. He's going to come like live with us. And here's Exodus 35. That's where we are. So if you're physically able to stand for the reading of the word, I'm going to ask that you would. Exodus 35. We're going to read verses 4 and 5, but we're going to really be all over the entire chapter of 35 and 36. Moses said to the whole Israelite community, this is what the Lord has commanded from what you have. Take an offering for the Lord, every one of you who is willing. Let's pray together. God, my, my thought is, is that in this room, there are many of us whose our hearts will not be willing. They are not willing now. And Lord, we need you to stir our hearts to cause us to be willing whether that's to come to faith in Jesus for the first time. It's not faith that we have. It's not going to be an intellectual ascent. It's going to be you stirring our heart. Or, Lord, that we're supposed to continue to go with you on this journey of discipleship. And we're not going to be willing to take that step. We're not going to be willing to sacrifice. But, God, <laughs> I pray that you would stir our hearts calls us to be willing so that you get glory in all of it. Help us to trust you more. Lord, I believe that's what the life of discipleship is. It's just one more day of trust. Minute by minute, when we hear the news of tragedy, it's just trust. So God, I pray that for all of us in here. For the glory of your son's name, we pray. Amen. Hey, um, God invites them to go on this journey with them. They've already been pretty far, haven't they? What we just covered, they've been pretty far on the journey. But God invites them to go a little bit further. And that's going to take an enormous amount of trust. First off, it's going to take trust in leaders. Okay? The people of Israel are going to have to trust, hear this phrase, they're going to have to trust God in leadership. Look, Moses said, Moses said, Moses comes back down from the mountain and says to them, they weren't up there. 
They weren't privy to this conversation. They haven't heard any of this. Moses said, the Lord has commanded, bring an offering. You bring your stuff. You bring your valuables. Moses could be doing this for his own benefit. Moses could be wanting a raise. He could be wanting the bracelets or something. I don't know why he wanted a bracelet. He could be wanting the necklaces. He could be want Moses could be doing this for any other reason. Okay? So they have to have an enormous amount of trust of God in leadership to be able to bring this. Now I'm gonna tell you though, when when you look at Moses, Moses had a pretty good resume, didn't he? He'd done some awesome things, hadn't he? He had some pretty good stuff that he had done in his past. That whole Red Sea thing, pretty impressive. You know? That whole water just tapped the rock thing, pretty impressive. That he, God had been in him. God had been using him. So his past really spoke for itself. But I think what was more important was that they saw God in Moses because Moses prayed. Moses prayed. It says in Exodus chapter 33 that Moses used to go to the tent of meeting. Moses had this own, his own little tent where he would go, and it says that it's called the tent of meeting, appropriate name, because in the tent he would meet with God. Fancy, I don't know how that, it was a creative man, Andrew, I don't know how they came up with that. Anyway, it was very creative. But Moses had the tent of meeting where he would go meet with God, and it said that he would meet and speak with God as a friend does with another friend, face to face. It says when you read into this story that the people of Israel, that they would stand outside their tent and they would watch when Moses went into his tent and the, the cloud would descend as this symbol that God was there talking with Moses. And they would sit there and they would go, okay, is he gonna come out? Is he gonna come out? Because people don't talk to God and live. Is he gonna come out? And then Moses would come out. And it says this, that Moses' face would be shining. It would be glowing. And they would know that he had been with the Lord. So that's why they trusted Moses, because they knew he prayed and that God was in Moses. Jesus is a great example of this, isn't he? I think the disciples saw this early on. Jesus said that many times, I've got a scripture for you here, I believe Mark chapter 1, where we see that Jesus... It says that at sundown, there were crowds of people that would bring to Jesus um, all that were sick and were oppressed by demons. And the whole city of people gather around Peter's house where Jesus is. And they bring many who were sick with various, all kinds of diseases and all kinds of demons. And they were cast out. And Jesus would not even permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Now listen. But it says, and arising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and he went out to a desolate place. And there he did what? He prayed. Now watch. Simon, okay, one of his disciples. The others, it says, those who were with him, the disciples, they go search for him and they found him praying, right? And said, everyone's looking for you. Now here's what I think happened. I think they connected the two. I think the disciples said, okay, blind person, spinning some mud, he puts the mud on his face, dude can see, deaf person, he can hear, you know, leper person, there's no spots, and their limbs are reappeared. It's probably because this dude prayed. This dude's close to God. Guys, trusting in leadership is trusting God in leadership, and that's what they had to do to create, um, um, see this task accomplished. The other thing that had to happen was that the leaders had to trust God in the people. The leaders had to trust. There's an enormous amount of trust that happens in this relationship and discipleship and for something to be accomplished. But they had, the leaders had to trust God in the people. Here, look, verse, four, or verse 20. It says, after Moses tells them, look, here's what God has commanded. He wants you to bring all of your stuff, your gold, your silver, your goat's hair, red goat hair, purple goat hair, purple linen, all kinds of really stuff I've got laying around. My house, I don't know if you guys have any goat hair or anything like that laying around. I don't know why you would want goat hair, but it was like a really, really expensive thing. And they were to bring it. And Moses says, you need to bring this. But look, here's what happens. It says that the people, the whole Israelite community, withdrew from Moses' presence. Now, the last time Moses let them out of his presence, they built a golden calf. They don't have that much of a resume, right? Too much. But Moses trusts them. Aaron, the leaders trust God in the people. They have to leave back and go. They they leave his presence and they leave the church service and they go home. If I'm Moses, I'm probably thinking, are they going to bring back stones 
to throw at me, or are they going to bring back the stuff that I said that God said bring, right? But you, when you read this story, you don't find anywhere where Moses and Aaron goes from tent to tent, knocking on their door and saying, hey, you make sure you bring your stuff. Okay, I told you to do that. It was a command. God commanded it. Make sure you, you don't hear of that at all. They trust that God would move in them. Now, I'm going to pause here, something I didn't do in the first service. I'm going to tell you what, as a leader, someone in the church, this gives me incredible comfort in what we have to accomplish. None of it. None of it is from me, and none of it will be from you. God will stir in all of us, and I completely trust him in you. That's what they had to do. They had to go back to their tents, and here's what I think they had to do. They went back to their, int- their tents, and they had to ask. They needed to ask, what would they invest? It says here that Moses told them, from what you have, take an offering. So from what they had, they had to look around. Some had more, some had less, and they had to look around and say, okay, what do we have to invest in this? Now, here's my question when I'm reading this. I'm thinking, they're a bunch of former slaves. They don't have anything. Where are they going to get the stuff that Moses asked for? They've been in slavery for 430 years. It's not like they had an inheritance coming to them, right? I don't think the Egyptians gave them a severance package when they left. I don't. What, where are they going to get gold and silver and really fine linens and stuff? They, they don't have this stuff, but that's what they were asked to give. Verse 22, though, that says this. Verse 22 says this. Men and women alike came and brought gold Jewelry of all kinds, brooches, earrings, and ornaments. Where do slaves get this stuff? It turns out there was a severance package. Let me show you here in Exodus chapter 12, 36. When they're leaving Egypt, it says the Lord caused the Egyptians to look favorably on the Israelites. And they gave the Israelites whatever they asked for. So they stripped the Egyptians or plundered the Egyptians of their wealth. How did, where did they get that from? God stirred the Egyptians. Here's what I think they realize when they go back to their tents. I believe they realize that everything we have was from him in the first place. What we have laying around, is it's his. They learn to trust God and not the possessions because they know the possessions came from him anyway. Isn't that cool? They knew that that came from I think that, the, look, can you imagine though, God, look, these are... This is the first time they've ever had anything of value. And I, I was doing a little narrative of this. I didn't do it for the, for the service, but I wrote a little narrative. And I was thinking of this little girl, you know, and she's playing with the bracelets. She's praying with it. She's never had gold shiny things like this before. This is like awesome stuff to her. And can you imagine the parents? They've never had valuable stuff like this. So I imagine that they really enjoyed having these things. And they found security in those things. Because if we give these things up, and this whole Moses thing doesn't work out here in the wilderness, what are we going to have to fall back on? And I believe that their answer was, he is what we have to fall back on. And that's enough. That's enough. I believe that they realize, look, everything that we have was from him in the first place. First Chronicles says that they say, the Israelites say this, everything comes from you and we have given to you only what comes from your hand. Psalms 24 says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians. Everything that we have, right thinking, right living, and a clean slate and a fresh start come from, what, from, from God by way of Jesus Christ. Look, what a valuable lesson of discipleship for all of us in here. When we learn this lesson, when we realize that all we have is from God, then we will live like all we need is God. He's all we want. He's all we have to have. The possessions, we don't trust in them. We trust in him. And I believe that they had to ask this back in their tents. I believe they had to ask, what, what will we gain if we give? This is an investment. What's the opportunity cost? What is it that we're going to get if we give this stuff up? And you know what their answer has to be? God. We'll get him. Look, they made a mistake with the whole golden calf incident, and they knew it. Number one, the golden calf incident was from their own initiative. They wanted a God, so they made their own, and they saw how that turned out. Moses ground that God to powder in front of them and made them drink it. We won't do that here. Okay? 
But that's what he did. But look, look, how often have we made our own little gods in our lives, right? And even funded them. By the way, they fund the golden calf with the same things they fund this with. Same things, same items. But they're gonna get a different result because this time the initiative is from God. Make for me a tabernacle. It's not something they cooked up. It's what God directed for them to do. And what are they going to gain? They're going to gain him. Remember what they were going to get? God said, have the people of Israel build for me a holy sanctuary so that I can live among them. And guys, look, isn't that the goal of discipleship? You get more of God. You just get more of God. This, and by the way, this is not the Israelites paying God back for what he did. That's not what they're doing. This is how they are showing God the value that they place on his presence in their life. Did you hear that? They're not paying him back. They're not trying to say, hey, we want to earn our salvation and we want to pay you for it. He's already saved them. The blood's already been put over the door. They're already through the Red Sea. They already have manna. They already have water. He's done all those things for them. This is a show that they're going to say, God, we don't want this because we want you. Isn't that how relationships grow? Isn't that how your relationships grow with anybody? Is that you just get deeper and deeper in trust? You give them a little more trust, right? You sacrifice a little bit for them. I learned this this week. My wife and I, we celebrated our 25th wedding, I mean, 24th, 27th. 20, 24th, I've been doing that all week. I love it. Every time somebody's asking something, I was like, we celebrated 29 years this week. She's like, it's not 29. I've said something different every time. 24 years is what it is, I think. 24 years of marriage. Okay, yeah, applaud me for that because it's all about, no, I'm just kidding. Anyway, um, why wouldn't she? Nah, that's a joke. Here's what we did. Last week for our anniversary, we go watch the, the theater thing, Wicked, the Little Wizard of Oz thing. Let me ask you something, dude, or everybody. Do I look like a go to the theater and watch Wicked, dude? I ain't. I'm going to sit at home and watch the Dodgers beat the Giants kind of a guy. Okay? That's my, that, but I go to watch Wicked. I sacrifice an entire evening. I endured the intermission thing. Why? Because I love my wife, and I want to show her, look, I'm willing to do what you want to do. Right? Little did she know I had in the back of my mind, me and her going to go camping, you know, and that's what I was going to ask her to do. And we end up going camping, by the way, ask her about the possum bear. That's all you need to say. It didn't turn out too well, but first time she'd ever been camping in 23 years. Why did we do that? Why did she go camping with me? Why did I go watch Wicked with her? It's to sacrifice and give up. Look, I know it's not what I want to do, but it's what you want to do, and I'm going to do that. Look, this is a little bit of what we see with what God's doing here. Give this stuff up because you're going to get more of me. You're going to enhance the relationship. You're gonna, we're going to enhance the relationship. You're going to get a little bit closer. When you give up a little bit of whatever it is, and I don't know whatever that might be, you get a little more of him. Isn't that, what, isn't that awesome? Wouldn't that be a great thing to come out of this in our discipleship of our lives if we just give up a little bit of what we want just to receive a little bit more of what God is and who he is? They didn't try to pay him back for it at all. This was just a show of how great he was to them, and I think God honored it. After they realized this, after they're back in their tents and they realize all that we have is from him anyway, we just need to give this back to him for his glory. When they realize that all this, here's what happens. They are inspired to obey it. Now, I chose that carefully. I, like, I, I, I mulled over that word, inspired to, uh, this little phrase, inspired to obey for about two days. Okay, but it's what it is. It is inspired obedience. Here's what I mean by that. Here's why I had to mull over it. I thought it was a command. I thought it was a command. Moses comes out and says, the Lord has commanded. I thought commands were not optional. I thought commands, as it is, it is in the Hebrew, is an order. You don't have an option to obey it. So there's no inspiration needed. It's something you have to do, but God does not work that way. God does not give commands and makes us do it because he said so. He doesn't. He wants it to be willful. He wants it to be from the heart, from the heart, from the bottom of your heart, giving. That's what he's after. How, how do I know that? Because I want you to read, I want to read for it. This inspired obedience is so much better than any kind of coerced obedience. This is what he's looking for. Verse five, from what you have taken offering, how does it say it? 
Everyone who is willing. A command that's for those who are willing. Sounds contradictory, doesn't it? Here, let's keep reading though because they keep emphasizing it. Verse 21, and everyone who was willing, now get this one, and whose heart moved them. Hey, pause. Who moves your heart? Who's the only one who has control to move your heart? I can't. I can get you all teary-eyed. I can get you to laugh. But I promise you, I promise you, the only God can move your heart, can move your spirit, can stir your soul. Only God can. That's why I'm really confident in what we're going to do. That's why, they, that's why Moses, when they left, he didn't start biting his fingernails and think they're bringing stones. He knew God's going to stir their heart because that was the part of the command. Keeps on going here, verse 22. All who were willing, men and women alike, came and brought. Verse 29, all the Israelite men and women who were willing brought to the Lord the free will offerings. You get it? This is willful, cheerful, generous giving from the bottom of their heart. It has been that way all through time. This is what God wants from us. He wants willful, cheerful, can't wait to give it giving. David says in Psalm 27, I wake, I, I, I sacrifice in your tabernacle with shouts of joy. Who sacrifices with joy? People whose hearts were stirred. Okay, Paul writes about this when he writes to the Corinthians. He says, each one of you, now listen to this, each one of you must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly and under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful, cheerful giver. Now listen, you rule followers are gonna have a problem with this. Rule followers, you're gonna have a problem with this. Here's the rule, I follow it, and everybody's happy. No, he is not. He's not happy. Here's the rule, follow it. It's here's the rule, and because he said so. Say that again. It's because he said so. You get it? It's because he said so. That's why I do this. Because he, the one who saved me, the one who brought me across that Red Sea, the one who took my addiction, the one who took my life and killed it in front of me, the one who saved me from myself, the one who did all. He, because he says so. And that's why I'm cheerful about the giving, right? And that's why I want to do it. It's because he said so. It's so much different, but it is what God Desires. It's not because Moses said so. It's not because it's a command. It's because God, the one who loved us and saved us, said so. This inspired obedience produces incredible results, guys. Inspired obedience produces incredible results. Not inspired, coerced, obedient does not produce any results. But when it's inspired, God stirred your heart, Right? That's, look, if I'm, let me pause for a second. If I'm preaching and I'm talking about, I'm being saved and stuff like that, and, 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 and because of my words, they're persuasive and they start to turn in you and start to make you think about anything and you raise your hand to be saved that day, but God didn't stir your heart, stir your heart. He didn't move in your heart. You are not saved. There was an intellectual assent to something. God had to stir your heart through his spirit to quicken you and to make you alive. It is by faith in that that we are saved. Nothing that we could produce or work up. That's salvation. And this is what, when God inspires this obedience, oh my goodness, watch out. Man, something awesome is going to happen. Let's look and see what happens, okay? Exodus 36. Here's the end result. Moses tells all of them, bring your stuff. Bring everything, and y'all have heard they were stirred in their heart, and they all brought what they had been stirred for, and they start bringing it. Here's what happens. It says, they still kept bringing him free will offerings every morning so that all the craftsmen who were doing every sort of task on the sanctuary, the place where God was going to dwell, each from, his, from the task that he was doing and said to Moses, the people bring much more than enough for doing the work that the Lord has commanded us to do. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh my goodness. So Moses gave a command and word was proclaimed throughout the camp. Let no man or woman do anything more for the contribution for the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing for the material they had was sufficient to do all the work and more. Wow. I read that verse, for the material they had was sufficient to do all the work and more about a year and three months ago. And I walked into Skip's office and Heath was sitting in there 
And I said, this is what God's gonna do. This is what I believe God's gonna do. I shared all of this stuff with you guys this morning about Israel and Exodus and all of this because I believe God is asking us to do something similar here at HCC. I believe as one of your leaders that God has given us a vision to see 50 churches planted and 5,000 people baptized in the, next five, in the next five years from us. Now look, my face isn't glowing, but I'm gonna tell you what my heart is, okay? I believe God is stirred and I, I cannot wait to see what's gonna happen. And let me tell you something, I completely, skipping out, we, our leaders, we completely trust in you. I have seen you over the past seven, six years, ever how long it's been, do amazing, crazy things. HCC was born out of people saying, what can we sacrifice? What can we sacrifice? What can we give up so that God can be glorified? Some of you guys might know this, but I was the pastor here when this little place was called Second Baptist Church. And I watched a lot of folks sitting here, 60, 70 folks in here, all over the age of 70, sit down and ask each other, if we would give up this place, this facility, could it reach more people for the glory of God? And their answer was yes. Watched a bunch of gr a young group of people from Element give up a culture and things over, uh, um, that was um, operating out of the YMCA that was just flourishing for the chance that this might work if they would come together. And I've seen God do some amazing things. I watched a group from Pokeville battle for, for the glory of God and then create our upper Cleveland campus to where we have seen many multiple lives change, averaging 220 people to come to that service each week, seeing people baptized and saved because they sacrificed. God always uses it. He always honors it. He always blesses it. So I think that guys in HCC, in our young walk with the Lord, because we're just getting warmed up, y'all. In baseball terms, I think we're on deck, though. I do think we're on deck. I used to say we haven't gotten the batter's box. I really did. I mean, I'm sorry, we haven't even got on the field. I think we're on deck, okay? But here's what I believe. He's challenging us in our discipleship. He's asking us to go on the journey a little further with him, okay? To see if we really are people who want to launch and never land. To see if we really do want to reach people that are far from God to see if we really do want to go and build communities of believers and be the church that God has made us to be. And he's asking us to go on that journey. And that's what I want to ask you guys to do. I want to ask you to keep going on this discipleship journey with us. And it's what it is, guys, discipleship. And somebody asked me here a while back, so just tell me how much money you need from us. I said, this is not about money. This is about sacrifice. This is not about that. It's about discipleship. And if you go home and sit around the table with your family and ask what sacrifice looked like to us and God stirs your heart and you, it's God stirs your heart and you obey that, then man, I've done my job. I've done my job. This is about us following him a little bit further on the journey and providing for us and us trusting in him. So I'm gonna ask you guys to ask God, what do we have? What can we give? What is it that sacrifice is gonna look like to my family? I've already had people come up to me and say, I've got this property, I've got this home, I've got this place at the lake, I've got, I've got a, a, a guy said, I've got an enclosed trailer that's brand new, here you go. I've, I've heard people say, I'm talking to Edward Jones. Edward Jones is gonna hate us for the next three years. But I've, I've talked with Edward Jones and I've restructured these things. I've talked with it and man, it has been incredible so far to see God stir in people's hearts. And I can't wait to see that day when I stand up and said that it's more than enough. It's sufficient for all the work that he's asked us to do. Okay. I ask him and then I want you to obey whatever that stirring is. Look guys, it's easy in services like this to get pumped up. That's exciting to see videos of buildings, man, to see, to think of um, 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 playgrounds here that's gonna really help us minister to young families. It is easy to get excited about that, but I'm gonna tell you, it's when the rubber meets the road is when we have to, we have to do what the stirring is, but it's the fun part. If you're here this morning, I wanna speak to you real quick. If you haven't accepted Christ as your savior and if you haven't even began the discipleship journey, I wanna tell you something, you're not gonna pay for it. <laughs> 
the blood of the lamb has already been put over your door of your heart. That happened 2000 years ago when the son of God stretched out his arms on a cross and bled and died for you so that you might have life and have life everlasting. What you need to do is walk through that door. Trust him today. The first time, trust in him. Look, he has already made a way for you to be out of your sin. Don't try to do it on your own. There's no Red Sea partings from you. He has already provided food for you with his word and his church. He has already started building a place in your heart to live. That's his tabernacle. For some of you in here, this is the first time that you've ever even considered, hey, what's sacrifice look like in discipleship? Oh, I cannot wait to see you get closer to God when you depend and trust on him and not something. 